the issue is that sometimes we don't have, in general, we're interested in material derivatives. But imagine that by some reason, we have available only the spatial description of the property. So this one. However, we would like to obtain the material derivative of the property. But we only have available the spatial description. Well, there, are, there is one way. Imagine that we have available the equations of motion. Then we replace in the spatial equation uh, a description of the properties. The equations of motion, which says that every small x is a function of capital X and time. And by function of function, at the end of the day, that is a function, a different function, of the arguments capital X and T. That is what we have done before, for instance, in the tensor of density. We replaced, uh, well, we, we at the, op the opposite, but we could have taken the, the material, the, the spatial description of the density, replacing in that the equations of motions, and we have obtained the spatial description, of, uh, the material description of density. And then we can take the, we can take the derivative. But what if we don't have the, equa the equations of motion available? This happens many times. Essentially, when we deal with, with spatial descriptions, in which everything is, dis is, is uh, described in terms of uh, space and time, and sometimes we don't have available the equations of motion. The point is that even though in that case, when we don't have uh, available the, the equations of motion, just having that, <coughs> could I obtain the corresponding material derivative? Material, not the spatial. The spatial is very easy. If I want to take the spatial derivative, the local derivative, just take the partial derivative of this function with respect to time. But what about if I want to obtain the material derivative just starting from that? Well, it's possible. And that comes just by taking what is called the material derivative of the spatial expression, okay? So look, here we use the right mathematical word. And remember, the, the name of partial derivative means it's taken this, D, this, this delta here, right? And that means partial derivative. And you know what this does it mean, that, so that you have to keep that, as I told before, no? that argument fixed, very the, the argument that you want to take derivative with respect to, and then uh, look for the limit. But now we are using a different notation. Look here, it's like capital a D here. It's not the, the delta, but the D. Or sometimes, in some books, it's used also capital D with respect to capital DT. That notation, that's a notation, look, this, this is something that we use very frequently, that, that means notation. So we are introducing a new notation. Okay, so the notation is that when I do that, derivative with respect to time, but here there is not the partial sign, the, the delta, but a d, that means that I'm aiming at taking the partial derivative with respect to t, but of the material description, okay? Of the material description, if I had it, okay. So now we use a mathematical concept that maybe you are relative with. So what I want to do in the material, in the material derivative of a spatial description, look at the, the, the words, now are meaningful. The material description, the material derivative of a, spa, a spatial description, okay? So in that case, what I want to is implicitly, I want to arrive to that. So I want to consider that in that expression, X is no longer fixed, but X depends of space and time. And then depends time. So I want to take the derivative with respect to time of this expression, but considering that this small x depends on time through the equations of motion. So there is one time here. And also there is one time here. So now, if I, take the differ if I differentiate this function, Considering that time is both inside here, 
through the questions of motions, and here. So time, time is twice in the arguments. Then, if I do that differentiation, taking into account this fact, then I'm just doing the right material derivative. So, in order to obtain the material derivative of this spatial description, what I do is that. First, I take derivative with respect to that time. Taking derivative, partial derivative with respect to the time, is just doing what we have just defined as the local derivative. Okay? Local derivative. Variation of the property in a certain space point with respect to time. But then I have to take derivative with respect to that time here. And to do that, something that you may, may, may remember, or should remember, is that we can differentiate a function of the function. So for differentiating with respect to the time, this means that there are three arguments here. Never forget that here I have x1, x2, x3, right? So I have to differentiate with respect to that coordinate. So di differentiate gamma with respect to partial derivative with coordinate x1, and then differentiate x1 with respect to t here. And then dif plus the derivative of gamma with respect to x2 times derivative of x2 with respect to t, and finally, derivative of gamma with respect to x3 times derivative of x3 with respect to t. That is what mathematics says. To take derivative of a function of a function, then you have to first take derivative with respect to the first function, and then multiply that by derivative of the function with respect to the argument. So that's coming from mathematics. Probably, if you just have a look onto your all notes on uh, infinitesimal calculus, you will see that. Okay. Look, here, there is a typical case and you have a repeated index. Repeated index in i, that means that this is a symmetry. So that means it's the derivative of gamma with respect to x1 times the derivative of x1 with respect to t, plus the derivative of gamma with respect to x2 times the derivative of x2 with respect to t, plus the derivative of gamma with respect to x3 times the derivative of t with respect to t. Okay? So now, we have a different derivative. We have dif differentiated with respect to time that evolution, that, that property, but taking into account that, in fact, we are differentiating that function with respect to t. That, that derivative is exactly that derivative. But look, that function is never computed here. Look, this is our derivative, local derivative of the, of the material description, and this is derivative of the spatial description with respect to space times this. By the way, what is that? Well, we'll see that if I have the equations of motion, this is a question of motion, and I take derivative with respect to time of the equations of motion, of the direct equations of motions, what do I obtain? Can you imagine? So imagine I have a particle that moves following a certain path from the reference time, so the initial time, to different times, right? So at every time, I have a position of this particle, okay? That position is given by the equations of motions, okay? If I take derivative with respect to that position, with respect to, to time, maybe you should remember from your all mechanics uh, subjects that this returns what? The derivative of the position of one object with respect to time returns what? The velocity. The vector of velocity. Okay? So, in fact, now going back to the equation that we paid attention to, that equation here, look, this equation, in this equation, in the, sorry, in, uh, uh, in here, here, this are <coughs> the derivative, the component i of the derivative of the position of the particle with respect to t. So that is the component i of the velocity. And that is the component i of the gradient of gamma. Remember that the gradient of a scalar function is a vector that has three components, every one being derivative of gamma with respect to x1, x2, x3. So look, this is nothing else than the product 
of the derivative of gamma with respect to x, which is the gradient of gamma, scalar dot product, dot product, the velocity, the velocity. And these are two vectors, and you know that the product of two vectors is commutative. So I can put the first times the second, or the second times the first. So what imp imp it's important here, not, not such a mathematical derivation, what is important here is the final result. If I take the material derivative of a spatial description of a property, let's say kappa, that is differentiating with, uh, with respect to time, but accounting that time is twice in it. One as that argument, but also there is another time inside that argument. Then I obtain the evolution with respect to time of the property for a given particle, which is the material description of the derivative, the derivative. And then this derivative has two parts. The first one is the local derivative. So that first part is what I said that was the local derivative, the change of the property in a given point, in the point where I'm computing that derivative. But there is a second term that is the complement, that term, the quantity that I have to add to the local derivative to obtain the, mat the material derivative, which would be that one, and it is called the convective derivative. So that's something that is maybe the first time you hear it, which is the local derivative concept and the convective derivative concept. This refers to derivatives with respect to time, time derivatives, and we say that the material derivative of a spatial description of a property is the local derivative, local meaning the derivative as a fixed point of a space, plus something which is due to the fact that the particles move. Okay? And this is expressed by this local convective derivative, is expressed as the product of the velocity and the gradient of kappa, <coughs> the, the spatial gradient of kappa. That's something that you already know. This symbol is the, the Nabla operator, which symbolically is an operator that has component one, derivative of x1, component two, der derivative with respect to x2, and so on. We also had a look on that in the past, in the preliminary chapter. So that is the expression that you have to keep in mind. That's a very important expression. Look, <coughs> there is some more physics on that. The word convective is something that we use in continuum mechanics. Convective is everything that is related with the movement of the particles. If the particles don't move, how is the velocity? The particles remain uh, fixed. In that case, I have that. Okay? And I don't move them. But for instance, to say one property, I could put some heat here. And you know that after a time, I, I, noticed, I noticed some increment of temperature here. That means heat has been moving from the point that I've started warming, uh, warming up, heating, and then a, a long time it changes. So the fact that the, movie, that the, 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 the continuum medium do, doesn't move doesn't mean that the properties doesn't change. Like that's an example. So in that case, the velocity is zero. Okay? However, the temperature of particles change a long time. So there is a material derivative. Okay? In that case, how much is that convective derivative? If there is no motion, no movement, the velocity is zero. That part is zero. But that part is not zero. Okay? So when there is no convection, properties of particles can change due to other effects that are not movement. But when they move, they move, there is an additional term that sums up to the local derivative that is necessary to give the right expression of the rate of change of the property with respect to time for the material. This is the convective rate. So this term 
when there is no motion, motion, movement, and convection are equivalent terms in a continuum mechanics. Maybe you are familiar with the term convective clouds that in the meteor shows in the, in the in TV, they say there is convective clouds, clouds. Or this room is heated by convection, uh, convection, convective heating. What does it mean? That in that radiator there, there is some heat that warms up the particles in contact with the radiator, and then these particles move and transport the heat and arrive to me as some heat. So that's what I say, this is a way of, of sending or producing heat by convection. The heat comes to me from there through the movement of some air particles that got heated, uh, heated there and arrived uh, with some uh, heat with me. There is another way of transmitting heat. For instance, there is the conduction way of transmitting heat. You remember that? Conduction means that in a bar, and take a, a metal bar and just keep that, hold that in one hand and just warm the other side with a lighter. And then there is no motion. The particles are not moving. But you see that very soon you will, say, will, will get burned in the other hand because the heat has passed from one side to the other. But this, there is no particle moving there. It's just some other type of transportation of, of, of uh, the property heat which is not convection, is conduction, okay? So, yeah, we will review these concepts. We see that properties in continuum medium can m transport in different, in different ways. One is associated to movement of particles. The particles carry pro properties, and as the particles move, the property gets transported, okay? So that's convection, but sometimes, Particles can send properties to other particles staying at rest, okay? Like throwing the particles to each, the property to each other. That's another way of transportation of, 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 of properties. And this part here, this part here, means the non-convective variation. See, the, 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 the variation along time, the rate of change of the property do, due to non-convective uh, effects. And this means that part of the rate of change of the property <coughs> that comes from motion of particles. Okay? So that is the physics that you have to understand this equation. That is the convective rate of change due essentially to convection of particles, to motion of particles, and this is the non-convective uh, um, rate of change. Okay? <coughs> 